is that darn Cardi Jew? They're making us ravenous look horrible. If you've enjoyed this program, please click like and subscribe. Mocha Shem, Mocha Shem, welcome to another si exciting Torah Watchman edition. The Torah Watchman show, you can only find it on YouTube. If you need a Gmail account to subscribe, you don't have a Gmail account, it's easy to, easy to configure and set up. Um, I believe, uh, I believe you can be a, a teenager or younger than that to set up a Gmail account. It's really, uh, really intuitive and easy to set up. Anyway, welcome to a Torah Watchman show. We're talking about a Torah Parsha Emor, which is, which is the first couple words in Vayakra, chapter 21, verse 1. The Torah Parsha goes to chapter 24, verse 23. The book of Leviticus, we're picking up where we left off last week. So Emor, it actually means say and tell them. Very uh, emphasis is very important in contextual relevance to something that was written thousands of years ago. Remember, if it's not in the five books of, of Moshe, it was not recorded in there. It was not intended to be taught today in this current generation. That's a lot. There's a million of other things that occurred in the life of the Jews in the wilderness of Mount Sinai in that area. Uh, tribal disputes, legal disputes, uh, capital offenses, all kinds of things, um, uh, disputes with other tribal nations around them, the Canaanites, and things like that, uh, marriages, divorces, uh, even minor prophecies for, for you're going to have a boy, you're going to have a girl, this kind of thing. So there were a lot of things that are not germane to today's generation to be passed on thousands of years against written tr tradition, what you can read in the five books of Torah, and oral tradition that's elaborated further in our Talmudic and Mid Midrashic writing uh, that we could find in our in our oral tradition. So where I'm going is here, he more, God wants to emphasize, he's speaking to Moshe, who he had a very wonderful close relationship with. Moshe enjoyed a a face-to-face -face encounter with Hashem, and he enjoyed without going to sleep and having a night vision like Prophet Daniel and other prophets, uh, to be able to communicate with Hashem as actively as I am attempting to, to communicate with you. So in more of the emphasizes, uh, I would say, two main uh, breakouts in the, in the entire parasha. The one is, what constitutes holiness for the Kameen as witnesses to the Jewish people? And what constitutes the prohibition that lead ultimately to contamination and, and a state of de-elevation to not be holy? So these are very important things. So God was trying to get attention to Moshe. He had private conversations with Moshe, and some of those things were written down. Some of the things were just private, and and things that that he noted um, to his family members, but other things. They were very critically important to get across the the uh, the uh, Kohen, the the um, the Aaronic priesthood I'm mentioning here. Remember, any of the sons, grandsons, or direct descendants from Aaron was considered a candidate candidate as a uh, Kohen Gadol high priest. Okay, now of course I'm speaking of I'm speaking about that lineage from Aaron, but I'm also speaking about the Levitical tribe of Levi. They were also helpers and apprentices that helped kept the tabernacle of Mishnah functioning. So, uh, beginning with the first Aliyah, there's an obligation of the Kohen to remain at the highest level, equal to, to, the, to the angels, you know, um, equal to the angels in a high level of ritual purity at all times. And, and there was uh, preconditions on what women they were entitled to even marry, okay? Um, it was not an easy life to be a, a Kohen. Uh, it was not. Uh, they had probably more prohibitions on them than they had uh, and, uh, advantages as far as things that, that, that you could do. For instance, um, Sometimes, you know, 
God forbid a colleague's wife passes away. And what are you going to do with that? Well, the, uh, the ritual is that they can only marry a virgin. Someone has never been married, not a divorcee, um, preferably in the Kohen family line or the Levitical family line because there were prohibitions there that, that if you were in a tribe of Benjamin, you had to marry someone else in that tribe. So there were pro prohibitions about that. Also, something that was uh, horrific and something that's tragic, and it happened a lot among uh, two million people plus there, different ages and people passing away or people dying from plague or disease or people murdered by surrounding nations, you know, as corpses, you know, dead bodies, or encountering a, a dead body of a Canaanite or something, you know. How do you deal with that? What if you're walking down the road and you look down and you thought you stepped on the rock and it was a skull. I don't want to be gross here, but I'm saying just little things like that was enough to contaminate that elevation stature of that Kohen uh, and his entitlement to to enter the uh, Holy of Holies on, on Yom Kippur uh, once a year on that holiday, uh, to go in to pull aside the curtain. Um, they weren't allowed to go in until they were ritually clean, okay? It was a very important thing. Remember what happened to Aaron's um, oldest sons. Uh, they they were struck down with the Lord our God because of introducing an alien fire. Even uh, after eight days of boot camp in the tabernacle of what you're allowed to do, what you cannot do, God's heart was broken over that. Understand, when God writes writes uh, the laws of the Torah in heaven before they were given to, to people on the earth, those laws cannot be broken like a king's edict. If he signs on his signet ring on a parchment, this is the, the king's edict in the land, he cannot go against his own ruling. And this is the same thing that Hashem said. My laws are already in effect. These are what the laws are. And if, if you disobey these laws, bad things can happen. So um, in the second Aliyah, we're talking about um, body blemishes, okay? We don't like warts. We don't like moles. We don't like... Uh, disfiguring things, uh, people, unfortunately, that's just the way we are. We're walking down the street. We see someone with uh, missing an eye, have an eye patch on. I see someone missing an arm uh, or is on a, on a wooden leg or someone who's been horribly burned, you know, God forbid, and things like that. We kind of avert our eye when we see that because it's not the parents that make me well, it just may disturb us or whatever. We don't know how to deal with it psychologically. But the thing about the Kohens there, what if you stayed out in the sun too long and you were sunburned? And you had, you know, you, you've seen people that get sunburned so bad that they have to be medicated, they have to go to the hospital. Uh, some people are allergic to too much sunlight and all these other things. Uh, but... If they uh, are inspected that they have a blemish or something, uh, hopefully the heal after a period of time, but temporarily uh, they are removed from their from their priestly duties. You know, uh, burnt offerings and sitchin altar and the altar and in the uh, in the mishkan, you know, for for fragrance and those things. Um, they were they were exempt from doing that. Sometimes they lost position entirely if they lost a leg or something like that. Think about the animals, folks. A uh, he goat, she goat, a, a, you know, um, a lamb or a bullet or whatever. And these animals had to be perfect in every way before they could go into the burnt offerings to represent the Jewish people as an acceptable offering for the Lord for forgiveness of, of, of sins, of unintentional sin primarily. Uh, in the third Aliyah, um, I just mentioned the breakout here. Talks about blemished animals. This happens. Uh, there's a nice little story, I believe, if I remember, uh, Yaakov and, uh, in Haran with, with Laban and how he marked certain, certain, uh, of his animals, uh, based on specs and things of that nature. Well, uh, either, either a, a lamb is white completely or it's not. Uh, as either a red heifer is completely red or or not, okay? I'm sorry, um, uh, a zebra would not be allowed there, okay? It has to be one or the other 
by imperfection before God. Also, the um, the importance of the mitzvah of Kadesh Hashem, sanctifying God's holy name by giving one's life rather than transgressing certain cardinal sins. Fortunately, this happened in the time of Rashi and Ramban, you know, um, you know, in the Iberian Peninsula, in that area, Ramban literally ran for his life uh, to Egypt, to Israel, to Africa, Algeria, and other areas like that, running for his life because, because he refused to take the knee to, to, uh, to become a Muslim. You know, he he's a proud Jew, and he avoided that situation. In fact, many rabbis told, told the Jews there, it's better, it's better for you to die or lose your head or whatever than you to um, break your commitments to Hashem, burn your Torah, burn your Talmud books, your prayer books, and then go into a mosque and worship as the Muslims do. Let the Muslims worship as they, as they do, as the Jewish worshipers do. But, but during some times, it was really bad, really terrible. Um, I, I don't want to get into history and everything else throughout Europe and the Soviet Union. It was not easy to be a proud Jew uh, to be an observant Jew, uh, to wear one of these, or a keeper, or whatever. But sanctifying God's name is the is one of the emphasis in this Torah Parsha of Imar. The fourth Aliyah, the rather le lengthy section, I won't go into exacting detail because of time. Uh, we're talking primarily on the high holidays. We're reminded about Omer, counting Omer. We just had a lot of uh, like the Omer, um, um, you know, on the fourth day of, of the ER, exactly, exactly 30 days from the second day of Passover. Uh, this is an ancient ceremony and a ritual. We don't have the temple anymore, but it talks about here that Passover is an absolute high holiday, it defines a Jew from the Gentile or something other than that about, um, uh, eating matzah, the joy of eating matzah um, uh, during those seven days. Um, and uh, the counting of the Omer is very important. You know, I always talked about before what Omer is. It's a measurement of grain or wheat. And actually, the Kohen pr priest on temple times, even in the tabernacle Mishkan period, and when the Jews were in the desert there before they crossed the River Jordan into Israel, uh, they would take a shaft, if you see a big, um, I don't know what you call it, a big leaf of, of wheat or barley, whatever, and it has the kernels at the end, and you can hold it as a stalk, and you literally wave it, uh, wave it uh, toward the, uh, the ascension altar, and you also have a, a uh, other uh, animal sacrifices along with that. But it's a measurement of grain, uh, nomer is a measurement, so we have uh, kilograms and things of that nature, so it's a, it's a specific uh, uh, measurement. Anyway, we're counting Omer for about up to about 50 days and, and until Shavuot comes as another holiday. And this talks about that as well, the giving of the Torah. A reminder that the Shafar, the, the ram's horn, is to be blown during Rosh Hashanah. That's the Jewish New Year on our Hebrew calendar. Um, I traditionally blow the Shafar to wake up the... Uh, the uh, people around my neighborhood. I live in an era, um, a predominantly Orthodox Jewish community, but there are other people who are not Jews here. So I learned this uh, tradition, like in Jerusalem, that people blow the Shafar to announce that the, the, the Queen of Shabbat is coming. Yeah, we have a little tradition at home about the Queen of Shabbat. We blow the Shafar, and we sing a wonderful song about that. Not getting into that detail, Yom Kippur is about afflicting yourself. It's when the, the books of life are open briefly um, to in the, book, the books of death or whatever to make sure your name is not expunged from the books of life. Then you afflict yourself. You go about eating. You go out shaving. go out without marital relations. You go about um, uh, cleaning yourself or whatever. Fasting is a hard fast. No work or whatever. It's a time of mourning. Uh, supplication. Uh, the sixth Aliyah talks about the autumn holiday. All these holidays come in a specific season and a time of the year. Uh, Passover has to come in the spring, in the month of the sun. Um, and uh, 
So cold has to come during the autumn time frame because it's an autumn holiday of gathering in the harvest and other things of that nature. Well, where there's a seven day uh, holiday uh, that we are uh, living, get outside of our home and live and live in a hut. Yeah, a makeshift hut where you can see stars uh, through the roof and not very good substantial roof that hopefully it doesn't rain on me. Um, so we, we uh, have four species of citron, palm branch, myrtles, and willow. So um, before I get off topic too much, uh, this parashat in Leviticus chapter 21 through chapter 24 roughly, if you want a brief synopsis of the, of the, of the uh, time holidays, a major holiday that Jews uh, celebrate throughout the year, it's in this area. If you want to make sure that you know wh which holiday comes after what, it's all in, in sequence. And based on the sun and, and lunar cycles. Uh, the final holiday is Shemini Azarat. It's a one day uh, holiday immediately following Sukkot. Um, the seventh Aliyah, we're talking about instructions to use the purest of olive oils for the daily kindling of the Temple Menorah. I've spoken about this before. Uh, cannot have any debris within it at all. It has to be absolutely pure. Um, uh, to go into the temple menorah and it has to burn all night essentially and it, and uh, this is one of the duties of the cult Kavim Gadol. Um, also uh, the story of a Jewish man who is put to death of uh, a blasting God. Now this is uh, potentially a controversial uh, section here. Not every Jew believes in capital punishment, you know. There is actually the death penalty on the books in Israel, believe it or not, going back to the 1970s when the last Nazi was tried there and hung. But since that time, we just don't have the stomach to put even a murdering Islamic terrorist to death for murdering Jewish families and children and women and everything else. We put them in prison and then they end up getting out of jail for free in a prisoner exchange. And just, just, it just is what happened. But you want to know where capital punishment comes from. Some states in the United States have enforcement on capital punishment with witnesses, DNA evidence, all these things, uh, conclusive evidence, all this before they allow the capital punishment to even be considered. Um, there is an appeals process for all of that. Um, but but um, let me read this section here. You can read with me in chapter 24, uh, verse 10, a son of the Israelite women, woman went out, okay? Yes, a Jew. And he was a son of an Egyptian man among the children of Israel. Very inter interesting there, okay? So so he was a, a Jewish born, but his father was 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 a, of Egyptian descent. So they fought in a camp, and the son of the Israelite woman and the Israelite man, and the son of the Israelite woman pronounced the name and and Last scene, so they brought him to Moses. So they got into a civil dispute, okay? There was a fight in the town. And you know how things <clears throat> unintentionally occur there. You get in that fit of rage, and this is something that every rabbi encourages their flock to be very careful uh, about getting angry because it's a slippery slope that can lead to unintention, unintentional circumstances. So what happened is that um, the son of the Israelite woman pronounced, and his name is not even mentioned here, uh, uh, and blasphemed the name of God. Uh, who knows what he said? Uh, so they brought him to Moses. And evidently, many people heard this and saw the fight and heard God's name blessed. The name of the mother was uh, uh, Shalama's daughter of Devri, of the tribe of Dan. So the mother was identified here. And they placed him under a guard to clarify themselves through his shell. Okay, so someone is accused of a crime, but you know, even in ancient times in Israel, thousands of years ago, around 3,400 years, whatever ago, they had, uh, they can't just accuse someone of doing something worth capital punishment and then carry them off to the, to, to, get to the gallows. It doesn't work that way. You have to have witnesses. You have to have a court system. You have to have a judicial system. They had judges there. So they brought him, um, this, this account was brought to Moshe, and Moshe brought this to Hashem. So what it said here in verse 14, remove the blasphemer to the outside of the account, 
And all those that heard, heard shall lean their hands upon his head. That's to remove the guilt. In, in other words, they were not involved in the blasphemy. Blasphemy. So the entire assembly shall stone him to death. And to the children of Israel you shall speak, saying, Any man who shall blaspheme his God shall bear his sin. Do I need to repeat that? Any, any man that blasphemes his God shall bear his sin and not the sin of others. So if you're Christian, this should be red alert, you know, like a Star Trek red alert going on right there. You're only guilty for the sin that you commit. A righteous person, uh, you know, cannot die in your place to alleviate your sin guilt. Very important uh, point to make here. And one who pronounces blasphemy in the name of his shem shall be put to death. This absolute commandment there. So you hear people curse God's name all the time in movies and contemporary social media, all these things. You know, I'm in the military. I'm with the boot camp in the Air Force. I heard God's name curse left and right, but these weren't Jews. These prohibitions are about Jews, folks, about Jews. It's expected for people that are not observant and those people that are not Jewish to do these things. But when you're elevated to a point here, that you are representing the image of God before an unbelieving people. It's God's name and reputation on the line here. That's why this penalty was so strict here. So then the entire assembly shall surely stone him, a proselyte and native alike. When he blasphemes the name, he shall be put to death. And then it goes further. If someone strikes someone mortally in human life, he shall be put to death. Premeditated murder and other things like that. Well, thank you for joining me for this uh, Torah Parashat in Emma. Um, It's not as long as some of these, but it's very important. Uh, how, how does this relate to you today? Well, uh, there's a need to consider what is holy and what is um, mundane, that's, uh, profane or not holy, okay? Only God defines what, what true holiness is. I mean, I mean uh, the whole thing about Shabbat is that we we temporarily in 24 hours raise our soul or nefesh back to Hashem to where it should have been and then put the golem side of us aside in our in our uh, contemporary thinking that's why we turn off tv sets we don't compose music we don't draw we don't work this morning, uh, whatever, there was a huge windstorm in my house before Shabbat. I picked up a lot of limbs and put them away. Not allowed to touch those limbs because if someone saw me, a Jew, touching limbs, it may think I'm taking to a burn home. And that's forbidden to a lot of flame during Shabbat. That's where I'm going. Anyway, God bless you. Please click the subscribe and link and personal notify. Please share uh, this video with your friends and go cohorts. Uh, I share this with people of, of, of my company that I work for. I share this with friends. Um, there's even Christians out there that told me, I like what you're saying you are. In fact, I, that helps me to correct some discrepancy I have in my Sunday school list. I don't know what to think about that. Anyway, I, my, as a Jewish man, we're commanded to read the Torah, commanded to read the Talmud, and not only to read it for ourselves and all benefit, but to elevate other people by, by teaching other people. It's like women are not uh, commended to read the Torah per se, but they are commended to listen when uh, men speak in a minion uh, and reading the, uh, the Torah in his in a pure angelic Hebrew tongue. And remember Ezekiel 18, 21, 23, uh, I cannot mention it enough, no matter who you think you are, what you've done in the past, you know, the world has one image for you. God has another image for you. God believes in you, but your so-called best friend that stabbed you in the back and took away your girlfriend or cheated on your wife or broke a, um, broke a, a, a faith commitment with you or whatever, stole from you blind or whatever, or got the promotion that you deserve, whatever the crime may be, listen, it may take you down to that, that bad street there, you know? You don't want to go there. But even if you did and you made these mistakes and you got into a fight, fight, I already told you about what happened in a fight, 
it get into a bar fight and you, you, you have vendetta and you want to get back on someone and you just don't forgive them at all and you and you treat them with ill will even though they ask for forgiveness you may never forgive okay blood feuds and all this you know but anyway god says i have a redemption plan for you sincerely with a contrite heart admit you've done wrong and then i will forgive you when you are contrite and you give charity to other people and you sacrifice that part of yourself in other words don't be angry anymore be happy and joyful and believing in god's forgiveness for you and make amends of those people accept that person offended you years ago and forgive them too okay and i want to remind you in isaiah in isaiah chapter 43 verses uh 10 and 11 if you have any questions at all who the one true god is read there if you have a question what salvation your sure really is read it god says i am your only salvation i am your only god so please don't get confused in these things and don't wait until the time of the mashiach uh, in zechariah 8 uh, 8 um 8 23 when 10 people that are not jewish will come from their their tribal belief system they said we were wrong you were right i'm sorry we supported the media's boycott against you i'm sorry we denied the holocaust i'm sorry i said i hated jews and blame them on COVID, uh, and blame them for COVID. You, I'm sorry. Please forgive us. Please teach us the Torah. Take us to Jerusalem. Take us to the temple of the Lord, your God. We want to worship God. And then we say, oh, man. So if the Jews got it wrong, folks, not speaking to Christians out there, if the Jews got it wrong, then why does it say non-Jews went to the Jew and said, Pomegranate, and Russian, please help me, please help me. Go to a Jew and help me because I have sinned in my faith system. You are the one that's right. I will see you soon. God bless you. Have a wonderful, restful weekend. We'll shout this to you. I have to get ready to uh, welcome in the Queen of Shabbat. So I'll see you real soon. Signing out here on Yara Ben Emmet. <laughs> Shabbos <laughs> Shame, man.